He understands he's going to walk across the Via Della Rosa up a hill called Calvary to the place of the skull and be crucified. That is all pressing heavily upon his mind. But in these last 24, 36 hours, what he's going to do is download stuff that he hadn't downloaded before. He's going to pour into his disciples some very, very important information. And this is called the Olivet Discourse. This is sort of the last official Bible class that Jesus has with his disciples. And so most of the time you say the best of what you have to say to last, hoping that people remember what you said at the end. That's what Matthew 24 and 25 is all about, and we don't have the time to really do an exposition of these passages, so we're going to just kind of survey them, and then you can read them, and we'll revisit them on Wednesday night. So Jesus starts his prediction about what's going to happen. Verse 24 of Matthew, it says, they come out of the temple. His disciples show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus says to them, do you not see all these things? And still I said to you, not one stone should be left here upon another that should not be thrown down. That was kind of shocking to them. It had taken 46 years to construct Herod's temple. And they're wanting Jesus to marvel over the temple, to marvel over the marble, to marvel over the gold and all the precious stone, the beauty and the majesty of the temple. And Jesus says, not one stone shall be left. He's predicting, predicting the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple that will come to pass. So he says to them, there is going to be some dark days that's going to come upon this nation. And he moves on. They then go to the mountain called Olivet, one of his favorite places to retreat to, to teach his disciples. And Jesus says to them, based on a question, they say, well, Lord, they're still, in their mind, they're still thinking about, he said, the temple is going to be destroyed. So now they raise the question, they say, Lord, what are these things going to happen, and what should be the sign of your coming? And so starting with verse 4 of Matthew chapter 24, all the way through the end of chapter 25, Jesus is laying out what the signs of his coming would be. So one of the first things he points out to them is that there, there are going to be many apostates, many false teachers, many false Christs will come and make claims that they are the Messiah. The second thing he points out in verse 6 is there's going to be a, a proliferation of national tension between nations, wars, and rumors of wars. Now, all through history, there have been wars and rumors of wars, but we've never been in a situation to where we are today to where there are so many nations that have so much military might and even some of the underdeveloped nations are now moving toward getting nuclear and atomic capabilities, which automatically makes them a world power once they develop that technology. And the very threat of someone like the people in North Korea or Iran having a nuclear weapon, it sends chills through the spine of the president and the Pentagon. And the fact that they already got one in Pakistan, it caused this tremendous nervousness. I would love, no, I wouldn't want to do it. I would not want to be at a Barack Obama at 5.30 in the morning. 5.30 in the morning, he receives a briefing. And he receives a briefing from his national security advisors. And they're laying out to him what they believe to be the threats that this nation faces both domestically and internationally. That's why the man's hair is graying so fast. Every morning you wake up to hearing about the potential breakouts of war all around the world and how it could affect the United States national interest as they to develop a strategy for that day to de-escalate the tension around the world and to protect the United States' best interest. So Jesus says there will be a growing proliferation of war and threats of wars, nations against nations, kingdom against kingdoms, famine and pestilence, earthquakes in diverse places, various places. And we're seeing 
unprecedented earthquakes in terms of the magnitude of the quakes here in recent days that we saw around the world in, in Haiti and other places. So he's describing a tough time. Verse 11, many false prophets will rise up and they will deceive many. And we've never had the type of proliferation of false religion, Christian cults, people being caught up into crazy things, Heaven's Gates, Jonestown, this other guy out in the Midwest where all these people died in this Sodom. False religions, false teachers, lawlessness will abound. The love of many will grow cold, but the gospel will continue to be proclaimed. In the midst of this negative backdrop, with the, the apostasy, with the false teachers, with the wars, the gospel will continue to be proclaimed. And in countries all over the world, many people are coming to Christ. There are revivals in places like Africa and other parts of Asia where the gospel is penetrating for the first time and gaining foothold and people are coming to the Christ by the thousands. The gospel is being preached. God's kingdom is advancing. Then he refers to the abomination of desolation. Many people believe that that's when the Antichrist will go into the temple and make sacrifices. So he describes a time of tremendous, tremendous stress and tension. And we don't know when this is going to happen, see. And so some people think that we don't see any of this. Well, I don't think that's the case. I mean, there's tension in, in parts of the world right now. People are starving to death every day somewhere in the world. People are being afflicted with diseases, and they're dying from diseases that are easily treated and cured in this country every single day. So just because things not like, like they're not happening here don't mean they cannot happen here in the good old U.S. of A. We are not guaranteed or promised that we'll be insulated and that we will be inoculated from some of the distress and the tension that's happening in other parts of the world already. I was listening this morning to uh, PBS and uh, Jane Goodall, which I studied about her when I was in biology class in 1970. And she's the lady who did all the study on, about chimpanzees and um, their habitat and so forth. Surely y'all saw Jane Goodall, y'all was in school, didn't you? Y'all learned about her, right? And uh, she's an old woman now, but she's still smart and she's sharp as a tack. And she was sharing on this PBS program, and she said that if every nation consumed the same amount of things that we consume in the United States to survive, we'd need at least four planets. You'd have to have four planets with the amount of resources that's on this planet if everybody had the same appetite that we have for stuff and things. It, it can't go on forever. We can't consume like we're consuming forever. And that was the point. You know, right, wrong, or indifference, that's why we're hated by a lot of people around the world. See, for many years, people didn't know that we were consuming up most of the energy and most of the food and most of the water. They didn't know. They were in the third world. They didn't have communication. They didn't have internet, cyberspace, TV. They, didn't have the, they didn't know how we were living over here. They didn't know we were living so large. So they started bringing those foreign exchange students to the United States, and they showed them a project, public housing, and said that's where the poor people live. In exchange, students, they kind of express that. What are you talking about poor people? You mean poor people live inside here? <laughs> and poor people have running water here? And poor people have indoor plumbing here? And poor people have utilities here that they don't have to pay for? And you call them poor people? And they compared poor people here to poor people in their country, and they said the people in America are absolutely sick. They're insane to think that they have poor people when the rest of the world is living on a couple of dollars a day to survive. That will continue to create tension around the world. And there's no way around this. Our consumption, people envy us. That's why people risk life or limb, get on rickety boats coming from Haiti to try to get here. Come across the border patrol take on the, to get in here. I was out in Phoenix, Arizona some months ago, and I met with some of the the Mexican people, 
You know what they said? We ain't going back. <laughs> I mean, they were just straight 